Hey folks, Dan Furrow here with the closing bell for September 10th, 2024. So we saw mortgage rates ease, they continue to ease further and further and further. Is that gonna continue through tomorrow? Well, that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the consumer inflation numbers to come out tomorrow morning, and that will determine basically at that point where the rates are gonna go from there from the Fed. But in today's video, we're gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk about some big news out from the Fed in regards to banking regulations. And yes, you might say, Dan, who cares about banking regulations? Well, if you're watching this video, you should be because it, it, it pertains to the markets. When I talk about the markets, I talk about the equity markets as well as real estate. So this is gonna play a whole huge role in all of that. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that. And then we're gonna talk about ETFs, what they are, how people use them to invest and why I use them. I choose them as my number one platform when I'm investing. So without further ado, let's get over to these things. We continue to see mortgage rates just inch down, little by little by little, like where they are. They're 6.22 right now in the 30 year. Other other rates are just flat right now. Why? What are they awaiting? They're awaiting the data that's coming in tomorrow with on the consumer inflation numbers. Tomorrow, that's what that number comes in. And then on, on Thursday, we have the producer inflation numbers, but tomorrow's numbers, that's going to be more of an impact than any other number this week. So that's what's happening this week. Let's look it over to see what the markets are doing right now. And it says right through here, two key uh, inflationary reports out this week. One's coming tomorrow and one's coming on Thursday. So that's what we're seeing right through there. Let's go to the headlines right through here. S&P rises for the second straight day as investors try to shake off September. September is usually the worst month of the whole year for investments. So that's why the headlines up through there. We do have the debate coming on the debate this evening. Hope you guys are out there watching that. You might learn something there. And then let's get over to Yahoo Finance. Fed scales back the proposal on banks' capital requirements. Last year, the, the Federal Reserve came out after the big scare of Silicon Valley Bank, and they're like, uh-oh, we might need to raise the, the, the reserve requirements on banks. Well, they just came out with a video or some in really important news on this. Well, let me show it to you. You guys might not think it's, it's important to you. These are things right through here that you need to know to kind of, this is what these things like this are what separates the haves with the have nots, because all this information helps educate you guys on where you should put, be putting your money to work. So without further ado, let's check out and see the changes that just took effect by the Federal Reserve and why banking stocks are actually down because of this news. They reduce the reserve requirements, but bank stocks are hurting from it. What's going on? So let's take out this video. And then when we come back, we're going to talk ETFs. Sarah, we're going to get to, I want to get to more of this on the banks, in fact, and get a reaction to that news that Leslie brought us at the top of the hour. So joining us here at Post 9 is Mike Mayo, senior banking analyst at Wells Fargo Securities. Um, are you curious as to why all the bank stocks are actually down, uh, other than Wells Fargo, which is barely up, Mike, uh, given, I would assume, what we heard from Leslie and from Vice Chair Barr is a positive, right? Well, uh, capital under the new Basel III proposal was originally going to increase by 19% for the largest banks, but we just heard it would increase by 9%. Uh, we were looking at maybe 5 to 7%. So even that cutting in half is a little bit more than I think some people wow. had expected. Uh, this was expected, so we have a little bit of buying the rumors, selling the news. Okay. And um, the devil's in the deep. Did you hear that? He said, buying the rumors, selling the news. That's what we talk about with, with the, uh, the interest rates. We watch the rates come down as the Federal Reserve, kind of the rumors are out there. And then when the Federal Reserve comes out and actually cuts rates, nothing really happens. But uh, right, what they're talking about is how much in reserves banks have to hold, the, the biggest banks in the country. Currently, they hold about 3 to 5%. They were supposed to increase that to 19%. And they settled on where, we, where he was just saying right now, I think it was about a 10% increase. So that's why the, the stock prices are down uh, right now in the banking sector. So let, let's let him take it away. I just wanted to give you the context of what this news was all about. Detail, so you, regulatory risk is just out there again. Right. Uh, well, give me your overall take then when it comes to capital, capital adequacy at this point, resiliency of our banking system, and whether in fact you believe that it should be a lower uh, number than what we've heard. Well, I think what's, as you know, I was negative on banks for 15 years. I know you were. And because banks were not resilient, and I would give them a failing grade. Right now, I would give U.S. banks the gold medal for resiliency. I would give, Why? I would give regulators 
a gold medal for resiliency a decade ago for everything they did, Dodd-Frank and everything that related to that, hence my gold medal here. Uh, look at the pandemic and how well the banks stepped up, especially operationally. Look at the, the regional bank mini crisis last year. The big banks were fine despite all the naysayers, despite front pages of the papers. And look at this year's Fed stress test. That stress test was more stressful than the global financial crisis itself. And even after running this model, banks still had plenty of excess capital to support the economy. So by the Fed's own data, banks are as resilient as they've been. And I've, this is my fourth decade, David, so I do give a gold medal to the banking industry for their resiliency. Recession or no recession, higher rates, lower rates, you know, whatever hits you, I think banks are able to weather it quite well. Now, as to what the stocks do, what the earnings do, maybe not as, you know, that always can fluctuate. But in terms of what's being evaluated now by public policy, look at the big picture and how far banks have come. Sarah has a question. So do you think they're going to fight this, Mike, as, as hard as they fought the last round? Well, the devil is in the details. I mean, for the last proposal, you, it started off saying um, the regulators would like to make um, you know, bank regulation more simple, and they said that in a thousand-page document. So I imagine there'll be a few hundred pages again. On the one hand, banks can simply you know, take the win. Hey, capital will be half as high as we as they thought before, or they could say, you know, we're going to fight it. So, look, I deal with the outcomes uh, as opposed to whether or not to fight or not. And so right now I'd say there's a little regulatory risk. It's not as bad as before. And the big picture takeaway is peak bank regulation has passed. It's just a question of how far that regulatory pendulum swings back a little bit in the other direction. By the way, this is the month of the 25-year anniversary of the introduction of national banking in the United States. And national banking 25 years ago uh, was perceived to create safer banks with more diversification by geographic regions and by products. And it certainly has done the trick. Another measure for the resiliency of the largest banks, look at the $7 trillion investment grade bond market. The largest banks have you know, aren't too far from the regular corporate bond, as opposed to the regional banks, right. which are perceived more risky. So it's the largest banks. Regulation has worked for the lar largest banks. So there's a question of how much more you need to pop above. Yeah. I want to get to, Sarah earlier said, you need resiliency and efficiency. I do think when JP Morgan says they have 80,000 pages for the Fed stress test, 80,000 pages for the living will, that there must be a more efficient way to ensure that banks are resilient. So I'll leave it at that. And I, I, I stop these videos basically when I think that the end of a conversation is over. I don't do it specifically for a purpose. Um, this, this also plays into role. Remember he said this is what the regulators did decades ago, the Dodd-Frank bill. So I want you guys to understand, too. When the housing market crashed back in 2008 to 2010, there was tons and tons of regulations to not let it happen again. And this is a big part of those regulations. So when people say, oh, here we go, the 2008 crash again, the guys, the whole in, in financial environment is, is, is almost completely different than where we were back then. Okay, so that, those are things that people just don't understand, especially a lot of the naysayers or a lot of the crashing people say, oh, see, the housing market's bad or whatever. You have to know the, the devil in the details, like he was saying before. Okay, so that's that part of it. So banking, banks are right now are well capitalized. They passed the stress test very well. And a lot of this transpired from the Silicon Valley Bank uh, about a year and a half ago. Remember that came and that was supposed to basically just dismantle all the banks in the whole country and everything was supposed to crash and it just kind of got brushed aside. He's saying the banks are in good positions right now. So that's that part of it. Now, investing your money. This is, this is a big section of where the haves and the have nots come into play. And the reason why I'm have, I, I say this is, you know, a lot of people aren't born wealthy. They have to basically trickle their money in and start investing money and let it grow over time. And that's what most people, you know, they, they should be educated on. I had a young man here this morning saying our schools don't educate us on any of this financial stuff. They teach us, you know, other things that we really don't need to know, but they don't teach us a lot of just the basic economics of our day. So I want to teach you guys today what an ETF is. Okay, so here's when I buy a stock, how I used to do it as a novice is I'd say, hey, I like semiconductors, so I'll buy one semiconductor stock. And if it wasn't NVIDIA, you probably didn't realize a lot of the gains. Okay, so that, that might be a bad analogy in the, in the tech sphere right now because of all the AI, but 
I hope you understand what I'm saying. So you have to pick the one winner out of the whole batch of, of companies in that, in that environment. So that what was created years ago was what was called a mutual fund. Okay, what a mutual fund is, is basically think of it as a basket of stocks. So let's say you like something, you like bank stocks. Okay, you like financials. So you're like, okay, which one am I going to pick? Well, there's a way you could pick a basket of them. So you could buy a mutual fund, which is a basket of, of, of the financials, stocks, or you can buy it, which was created uh, not too long ago, was an ETF. So I buy ETFs. Why? The pros are right here. I like trading it as a stock. The fees are, are low. It's basically, I, I buy and sell it like a stock. Mutual funds are a little bit more tricky. You can only trade them at the end of each day. You can get you get a bat, bid and ask at the end of each day where you can you know basically do that transaction and there's big big brokerage fees. So it, it'd be like you owning a stock that you can only sell at the end of each day. So during the day, if it's crashing, you just have to sit there and watch it crash. So I elect to buy ETFs. Okay, so let's get over to this. There's several ways you can do this. I went to BlackRock. BlackRock is huge. So I looked up their financial ETFs, and here it is. I share U.S. financials. It's an ETF. Here's the ticker symbol right over here. When they reference ticker symbols, here's the name. This is just like the abbreviation. Okay, then what you're going to get through here is here's the net asset value. That's the cost per share how much it changed today, how much it changed so far year to date, and their rating, okay? The, the, one of the biggest problems we had about subprime mortgages years, years ago is these ratings through here, when you would pull up a subprime you know, mortgage you know, investment, these ratings would say triple A, quadruple A. They're the, they're, they're the best ratings you could possibly get. And then those, those end up being worthless. And that was a big part of that regulation that took effect. So this is also an area where you can see where the haves and have nots. If you have money and you invested in this ETF, you're up 20% so far this year. Okay, so let's look at the home builder stocks. This is the one where everybody, home builders are going out of business. Remember, houses are going to crash all over the country. Nobody ever is going to buy another house or whatever. Look at the, the, the home builder stocks right through here. Year to date, they're up 16%. And they also have a one, two, three, four, five star rating uh, on that as well. So not saying that just because it's rated well, you know, it's a good investment. I don't own, I'll, I'll be honest with you, for transparency reasons, I don't own any of these uh, home construction ETFs. Um, just for the record. So that's that's how you understand these. If you go to BlackRock, here's all the ones you can choose from. It go, the list goes on and on and on. And again, look at some of these returns that you might be missing out on. Okay, so you missed out on it. The, the future might not replicate what we got in the past, but here's what I want you to understand. Did you even know these things existed? Okay, so for, for example, the S&P 500. You could just buy this right here, and you're going to capture the S&P 500. Look, year to date, it's up 20%. One year, it's up 27%. I hope you get what I'm saying. So you can go to the U.S. aggregate, the 1,000, and the list goes on and on. Look at this list. It just goes on. If you can think of it, they probably have a fund for it, okay? And you can just go down and down and down and down. So that, in essence, is what an, what a, a, an ETF is. I buy these if I don't really know the company I'm buying, but I know the industry that I want to be a part of, this is how I get into it. And the most broad one you can buy is the S&P 500. This is what I have usually have my kids in. I, I put them in this or Berkshire Hathaway stock. So again, folks, don't trade on what I'm telling you. This is for educational purposes only. That's it. I'm going to give you the areas where you can do your research, some funds that I buy, some stocks I buy, things like that, just to help you understand you know, getting you from the have nots to the haves, because if we can start getting you some returns like this, you might be in the market for a house one of these days. You might not be sitting on the side saying, oh, I'll never be able to afford a house or anything else like that. So that's the report for today. Tomorrow, again, what we have coming out is the CPI. That'll be out before the market even opens. So my report tomorrow morning hopefully is, hey, guys, mortgage rates just plummeted on the CPI number. I'm hoping that's what the news is for tomorrow. So um, if you want to find out more about me and what I do, I'm actually a mortgage loan officer. I'd love to help you if you're out there trying to navigate the, this environment. 
I'm licensed in all 50 states as well as Puerto Rico, so there's no excuse for you not to use me. But if you're looking to buy that first house, check out our Grant Finder uh, app right up through there. You're going to go through here. You're going to find grants that are available throughout the whole country and then the ones that are available right in the Chicagoland area that we have there. You're going to find a whole slew of other information up through here, resources and the whole gamut. But if you want to put in your application, uh, you want to do it online, you can do it right through there. Hit the Apply Now button. Or if you're like most, most people call in or shoot me an email. So if you want to do that, you can give us a call at 844-775-5626, or you can email me directly at dan at therateupdate.com. So thanks so much for watching, guys. God bless, and I hope, I just hope we're helping you understand the markets in general uh, more and more each day on my videos. So if there's more additional videos you'd like to learn about or parts of the industry, financial markets you'd like to learn about, let me know. I'd like to have, help you kind of navigate those environments so we can reach more and more people to educate them on finances. So thanks so much for watching, guys. God bless. Have a fantastic evening, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.